and we will be sending the link to the recording out to everyone who has registered later this week. I'm Rebecca Rowe. I'm the uh, Associate Director of the Community Revitalization Office, and some of the staff that we have on the call with us this morning are Kate Pickett, who is the administrator for our Enterprise Zone, Zachary Whitlow, um, looking around the room, um, Zachary Whitlow, Catherine Miller, Kyle Meyer, all are with the Virginia Main Street Program. Courtney Maley is on the road this morning. Uh, Jessica Hartness, Chris Kane, and Sabrina Blackett make up our microfinance team. So they work with the Resiliency Program, Virginia Individual Development Accounts, and Community Business Launch. Annie Arnest is also on the line, and she would be your point of contact for the Industrial Revitalization Fund. And I am going to tell you that sometimes when I talk about our programs and our staff, I literally have to count on my fingers to hope that I'm not missing anyone or anything. And it is very possible I'm going to miss something today. So right away, I'm going to ask for everyone's um, grace on that. I am also going to show you what is happening just off camera in my house, which is um, two dogs here enjoying the sun. And I do that so, number one, you can see how adorable two of my dogs are, but also because a number of us are working from home, presenting from home, if your dog, cat, child jumps into screen a little bit, ends up on the microphone or camera, please know that we, um, we are all good with that and it is not a problem. So I am going to start sharing my screen and start the presentation. Um, staff will be on the back end in the chat box um, answering your questions as they come through. And everyone feel free to take a minute to jump in the chat box. If you haven't used it yet, let us know who you are, what locality or organization you're with. And if there is a particular program with economic development and community vitality that you are here to learn more about this morning. Once I start sharing my screen, I am not going to be able to, um, to see any of you. So it's always um, interesting flying blind. And for staff, I will be um, looking for y'all to let me know that you can see my screen. We can see it well, Rebecca. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think that was Kate. All right. So again, thank you all for joining us this morning for the Economic Development and Community Vitality Roadshow. I am really gratified to hear the doorbell continuing to ring and people continuing to join us. So we do ask that everyone mutes themselves and uh, go ahead and turn off your camera for the presentation. It eliminates, um, you know, some visual clutter as people are watching the presentations and listening as well. Um, the webinar, again, is being recorded, so we will make this available to everyone later. And these recordings um, do capture the chat box as well, so questions that are asked and answered in the chat box will also be captured. Um, there will be time for questions using the chat feature because we have a number of programs and presenters that we want to get through this morning. Um, we are going to use the chat box for questions exclusively at this point. Again, staff will be on the back end answering those questions. And once each presenter finishes um, talking about their, their programs and resources, they will also jump into the chat box to answer questions as as they can. So thank you everyone for your participation. If we are running ahead of time um, towards the end of the program, we will go ahead and open it up for more conversations, but we will definitely also connect you with our presenters this morning if you would like to ask them more questions. And of course, our staff is always available to provide any kind of technical assistance that you would need uh, to, to take advantage of these resources and to put applications together for our grant programs. All of that being said, here we go. 
our agenda this morning, rather than just listening to me talk to you for two and a half hours, um, we thought that the best way to have people learn about these programs and how they can be used and how they can be layered and leveraged together for maximum impacts on your communities, it would be um, fun for all of us to hear from people across the state and communities who are using these programs, either currently using these programs or have previously used these programs. So we are going to uh, go through each of these resources in a, a form that hopefully makes sense in terms of what comes first, what comes second, what comes third, in layering all of these resources together, again, for maximum impacts in your communities. I'll introduce the program a bit, and then I'm going to turn it, each of these over to some of our speakers to tell us how they have used this resource in their community. So first and foremost, I would like to thank all of our staff who put these presentations together, as well as the speakers who are giving us their time this morning. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. We're starting with Virginia Main Street because Main Street is not only a program of the Department of Housing and Community Development, as well as the National Main Street Center, but it's also an approach to community revitalization that any community, regardless of their affiliation with Virginia Main Street or National Main Street, can utilize in their community. We do have four tiers of program participation around the state, and you can see our map here of our advancing Main Street communities. Advancing Main Street communities are those who have competed uh, in a, a competitive process that we uh, go through every two to four years, depending on our resources. These communities uh, have to meet national accreditation standards every year. And in 2020, I believe it was, that already seems so long ago, we did designate um, four new AVMS communities. And those are the ones that you see in orange on your screen. And so we are really excited that Taswell, Tappahannock, Anancock, and Cape Charles are a part of the program. We also have a tier called Mobilizing Main Street for communities who really want to use these resources to accelerate and kickstart their efforts, as well as Exploring Main Street, which is a tier for communities who attend our trainings and uh, utilize a Main Street approach in their community. And there is a grant program that accompanies that level of participation. Introducing Main Street is a tier that's open to anyone who wants to be a part of our network. And if your community is here on this call, you're probably in the Introducing Main Street tier without even knowing it. It really just means we have your contact information. So the overview of Main Street, uh, again, Virginia Main Street is a Main Street America coordinating program that is committed to creating high quality places and building stronger communities through preservation-based economic development. We offer a range of services and assistance to communities interested in revitalizing their historic commercial districts while utilizing that Main Street approach that we'll hear more about in a bit. And while the program um, is designed to address the needs for revitalization and ongoing management of smaller to mid-sized downtowns, again, aspects of the Main Street approach can be applied successfully to other commercial settings, whether that is a, a large central business district in an urban area or a smaller neighborhood commercial district. And with some recent additions in resources to our program, we are really hoping to be able to expand Virginia Main Street um, more broadly across the state, including uh, coming to some of those areas that are over our current threshold in population of 75,000. So stay tuned for more information there. Again, we do have some grant opportunities. The Community Vitality Grant is designed to aid exploring Main Street and mobilizing Main Street organizations and communities in achieving their downtown revitalization goals. And if you're not sure if your community is in one of those levels, be in touch with staff and we can certainly help you find out how to participate. The Downtown Investment Grant um, is very similar to the Community Vitality Grant, but that is only available to those designated advancing accredited Main Street communities. And we also have a Financial Feasibility Grant, 
that is first made available to the advancing Main Street communities. And if we don't allocate all of those resources, then we make that available to our broader network as well. Um, the downtown investment grant and community vitality grants are built to be very, um, very flexible. Tell us what your community revitalization needs are, how you would utilize this money essentially, and, and that is your application. So you can see the timeline there and stay tuned. We will be um, announcing the how to apply workshops for these grant opportunities very soon. Some tips for getting started with Main Street. Um, look at your downtown as if you are a first time visitor. What is positive or what needs improvement? Invite a Main Street volunteer or manager from another community to talk with a group of your community leaders about what that community and organization has accomplished and how the program works. You're going to hear from a number of successful Main Street programs today. Definitely get their contact information. These folks really um, know a lot about revitalization and how to work these programs. Uh, recruit board members and take them to other downtowns to meet with peers, hear about what works and see how your downtown compares. So these are just a couple of things you can maybe schedule for yourself uh, later today in getting a Main Street effort started in your community. Now we're going to turn it over to Todd Wolford with um, Downtown with Phil. And Todd is the executive director for Downtown with Phil, Inc., a 501c3 nonprofit in uh, Southwest Virginia. And under his leadership, Downtown with Phil has earned um, the uh, designation with Virginia Main Street as well as national accreditation. <laughs> Um, Todd, I can't see you, but I hear that you are unmuted, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks for that introduction and not going on too far with that. Um, <laughs> but um, again, thanks for asking me to uh, be a part of the program today. I'm a little bit under the weather, so if my voice starts to crackle or I need to grab a drink, just excuse me. Um, but um, just going to get started. I'm glad you... Um, went ahead and explained all that Virginia Main Street stuff because I was concerned that I might have to do that. But um, I'll just go right into the kind of the Main Street approach <clears throat> and and kind of how we started. Um, so again, I'm Todd with Downtown Woodfield um, and I've, I've been doing this job about six years now. And when we started, we essentially had nothing. Um, we had a blighted main street that needed work and we were kind of thrust right into a streetscape project so we were a little bit in survival mode from the get-go but we did function uh with the main street approach and the uh the four categories that you see on the screen there um that's how we kind of got started uh with organizing people and and really getting an executive team together to uh, become designated and accredited through main street america but um, you can go ahead and change the slide there, Rebecca. So through that four point approach, um, we felt that that was great in the beginning to get organized and to get folks understanding what Main Street was, but we really needed to um, create a volunteer pool that we could pull from, we could get dedicated volunteers. And so we, we have more of a subcommittee approach um, and through that, we were able to recruit many more volunteers to serve on special projects without the full commitment of the traditional standing committee structure, which you saw in the previous slide. Um, another reason is this enables us to have a much larger volunteer pool to pull from uh, for large scale events and really solicit quality volunteers uh, for important roles. And I think the most important reason that we do the subcommittee approach is this allows us to engage and recruit many more volunteers and really screen them to understand the motivation to serve. Um, you know, we've all had board members and volunteers that go on and on and on and on and things get stagnant. But with this subcommittee approach, it really allows us to pull from a huge uh, pool of volunteers screen those volunteers with a low commitment level, maybe it's a special project or an event. Uh, and we've actually encouraged, and we get board members from this approach as well, because it allows us to work with them in a capacity and see them work with other people and see how they work with staff. And if they're great, we ask them to come back. And if they're not so great, it was really a one-time commitment. 
So uh, that's kind of why we do that approach. Uh, but we do, it is a transformational strategy for us across the four, four points. So that's what works for us. You can go ahead. And some of our keys to success um, is really effective stakeholder engagement. Um, what we do is we need to understand what do the businesses want? What do the property owners want? So we can, we can have a better understanding of what we need to program for and what we need to do. I think in the beginning with Main Street, um, we did a lot of things on our own because we thought it was great. We thought it was impactful. And it was in the beginning, but now we really have to focus on what do the stakeholders want? Because everybody wants to do events and special projects, but if the businesses are not open and not supporting, then you're essentially wasting your time to a certain extent. But so we really focus on engaging the stakeholder through each event, special project that we do. And then we reassess and we follow up kind of that, that little graphic that you see there. That's exactly what we do. And we want their engagement. We, we want the participation. And we've had actually business and property owners kind of stepping up and being a bigger part of the big events that we do. And it just, it's, it's overall good for the community. Um, and some ways that we, tactics that we include, we have closed Facebook for downtown stakeholders, you know, direct email communication. And face-to-face -face is really what we want to do. If you know we have an issue with anything going on, I'm going face-to-face because, -face you know, that's just the best way to do it. And I realized through the COVID situation that that's been a little kind of put on the back burner, but not necessarily for us. We're, we want to go face-to-face -face and we want to we want to create the solutions for, for our community. So you can go ahead. So another one of our keys to success, uh, and it's a huge deal for us, is our public private partnerships. Um, and that paragraph there is very important for us because we have positioned our organization to be a liaison between local government and the private business sector. We organize, coordinate, implement activities and special projects that bring both volunteers, business owners, and paid staff together through our organization's subcommittees, which I mentioned. We work hand in hand with town council, lo local elected officials, and administrative staff to support all departments to see our visions through the community. It's truly an all-in approach here with our community. Um, we bring everybody to the table through our organization um, to obtain these goals and objectives for our community. So we've kind of made ourselves a little bit indispensable. And I think as a Main Street organization, that's, that's somewhat what you got to do because you always have to justify your existence. And we feel that we've done a good job of that and we continue to do that. So uh, some of those graphics there are some of the big partnerships that we have. You know, through our organization, we have two lo local breweries and obviously, you know, they're competitive, but through our organization, we're able to market, promote and collectively do things in conjunction with each other. Um, and it's been very, very rewarding for both of them. Uh, and we've had a huge success. It's really changed our nightlife here. And both of those breweries were gained through the CBL program, which I think will be spoken of uh, later on in this program. But we just want to work with everybody through our organization. Uh, we want to bring people together to to reach you know goals and things for our community okay you can switch it i think another one of our keys to success really is our having brand recognition you know who is downtown Woodville? you know when we first started everybody was like who is this organization what are they doing are they the town of withfield are they local government who are they so downtown Woodville is an to me it's an economic driver for the region that's the way I look at it. I mean, we are a major organization, but we are an economic impact driver for our region. And we want everybody to know that. Um, you know, education is key. We want to educate our board members. We want to educate our community and our, and our local officials what we do and who we are because uh, they need to know that. And, and through our brand, we do that on marketing materials and, and everything is conveyed through our brand now. So when people see that logo, they associate what we do with positivity, success, community change makers and things like that. So that's, it's taken a while to get there, but that's who we've always wanted to be. And, um, you know, brand recognition is key and it, and it doesn't happen overnight. And, and, but you have to convey it through everything that you do. So creating your own messaging and don't let others do that for you. We all know that social media can be positive, but can also be negative. And like I said, in the beginning, when we were in the middle of a, construction project that tore up our entire downtown, you know, we were catching it. So 
we had to educate, we had to create our message and the town really relied on us to do that through our social media. And, you know, in the beginning we didn't have it. Now we have 9,000 followers with, you know, 8,000 residents. So we feel like we're doing a really good job and our social media is very, actually the strongest in with County. So we feel good about that. You can go ahead and change the slide. And through all that that I've mentioned already, you have to engage the community to support everything that you're trying to implement. So again, social media is key and creating the, your own message because you have to portray everything that you're trying to do. So you engage the stakeholders, brand recognition, and now we're going to engage the community, support everything we're trying to do as a mainstream organization. So you also have to be open to criticism, new ways of thinking. Uh, you can't be stagnant in your, uh, your approach. So we always, um, open things up for people to comment. Um, Doug Jackson gave me a shout out, so I'm going to give him one. He actually um, came to our community and we did some stakeholder engagement when we were building a three year strate strategic plan. Um, and we invited people to the table. We want to hear what do you want to happen in your community? And, and we're going to take that, build a plan, and we're going to make that happen. Because a lot of times what happens is people come to you with all these ideas about you should do this, you should do that. So when we have this strategic plan in place, this is what we're doing. And this is, you know, how it's going to happen for the next two, one or two years. We will take your feedback and we'll, we'll, you know, look at that later on down the line. That way you don't have to get into saying, well, we're not doing that. Or he said, she said kind of stuff because people get offended really easy. I think everybody on the call knows that, but you know, the only way you avoid criticism is to do nothing, say nothing and be nothing. So we feel, you know, we want everybody's input on what we're doing. And so, and through social media is really, really how we engage people. We create our own message and keep it positive. So you can change the slide. <clears throat> now this is very, this is a very important part of our structure and how we uh, maintain success. We have engaged our local government to, to fund our organization to a certain extent. We don't have to have fundraising held, constantly held over our head to sustain our organization. So that's a very stressful thing. And for those communities that are on the call that don't have this partnership, you need to solicit this partnership. You need to have a seat at the table with your local government, whether it's council work sessions, council meetings, you need to be there. They need to hear from you. Um, and, and the unique position that we have is we, we always have a seat at the table. Uh, we're working on new ideas, working on various things for our community, and we're getting our council on board with things like that. And then we, through the community engagement, you know, it all works hand in hand with us, but we do so many things that the local government can't do. And I'm not going to read all through the, through all those there for the sake of time, but um, there's so many things that the Main Street Community Development Organization can do that, that local government just can't. So they fund us to a level, they trust that we're going to make positive impact in our community. And, you know, the work has shown itself. So um, we feel good about our partnership. And, but that is probably the most critical piece for us is to work with our local elected officials, town administrative staff, and um, it's been very successful here in Whitfield. Go ahead. Another big part of what we do uh, is in my previous position, I worked with youth in the community. Uh, and when I decided to relocate back to Whitfield, that was a big part of what I wanted to do is, you know, try to engage the youth because I was once one of those people that never wanted to be in Whitfield, but I had the opportunity to come back and, you know, engage them through my previous position and now we're engaging them through community development we want to know <clears throat> excuse me we want to we want their input on what we do here in the community for example to the left there we did a scholarship program which was basically a spin-off of community business launch but we did it for youth and we have a youth board member they're a voting board member um, and we want their input and we work with the school system through partnerships we have a technology center that can develop signage they did some medals for us there for a 5k and they we want to give the youth an opportunity to serve and create things for us before we go elsewhere so we're really focused on the youth here in our community so you can go ahead <clears throat> so this is is my last slide and i'm actually losing my voice so uh this is what main street can do for your community these are our statistics from 16 to 20 and we're working on 2021 right now but you can see those numbers. I mean, it does, we don't, we, we just feel really good about what we've done in a six year time frame, And, um, 
I would put these numbers against anybody in the nation, really. I, I talk to a lot of people across the nation, and uh, they're excited with what Whitfield's doing. And uh, we are, too. You know, sometimes the people that live here and, and see it all the time, they don't understand uh, the impact. So we have to continue to educate uh, and engage them so they do. So the education piece is critical, but we feel good about what we've done. Um, so, again, thank you for having me. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, look forward to hear from, from you guys, and I'll answer any questions in the chat. Todd, thank you so much. Uh, I honestly learned some things about it, the program there in Withville that I didn't know, uh, especially around it, all of the activities you're doing engaging with the youth, which I think is so important for communities to, to keep the youth engaged. And whether they leave and come back or they choose to stay, that's such an important resource in Virginia. And your investment statistics are always amazing. Um, I will tell you all that in Main Street, uh, we have a saying, R&D, which is rip off and duplicate. So I know that Todd would be thrilled for you to take any of these activities and ideas and make them your own. So now we're gonna move into community business launch. And I will say, you know, I, I referenced earlier that we were putting these programs kind of in order to think about first your ecosystem and then your built infrastructure and then the microfinance piece. We're gonna move community business launch from the end towards the beginning um, because we did um, lose our original speaker to illness and Ms. Diana Schwartz with uh, the River District Association in Danville has graciously uh, jumped into pinch hit, but she has another engagement later this morning. So we're gonna move community business launch up front. So we'll cover this one real quick. A quick overview of the program. This is a place-based entrepreneurial development program focused on a critical mass of priority vacant storefronts. So this is really a program that is built to, um, to address those issues of vacancies in our uh, commercial districts. Fill vacant storefronts with expansion or startup ventures that meet market-based needs and strategies. And this is, um, especially local entrepreneurs, creatives, and small business owners that have completed the training. And this training with CBL is a business planning curriculum culminating in an idea pitch to a panel of judges. So think Shark Tank. Pitch winners receive cash and in-kind prizes to kickstart their new venture in a in one of the identified vacant storefronts. And for the grant through CBL, we are looking for a minimum of three new or expanded businesses and five FTEs, which is a full-time equivalent. Ideally, this will prepare communities to replicate the process to continue filling storefronts while cultivating a more robust entrepreneurial ecosystem and better places to live and work. And I will tell you, we have had multiple communities um, start their CBL effort with our funding and then have enough momentum and interest in the program that they are able to continue doing CBL programming with private resources in the future. So um, annually we have $180,000 in our funding pool with maximum awards of $90,000 down to $45,000, depending on the match that you're able to bring to the table. And the funding can be used for administration, marketing, and then we have um, some minimums of, of how that funding can be used on some of those activities. These are just a few of the communities around the state that have uh, taken advantage of this program. The Advancement Foundation, of course, is not a community, but I think I saw Annette join the meeting earlier and um, the Advancement Foundation has helped to implement this program in a number of localities. Again, we have our grant processes coming up very soon. Keep your eyes open for the How to Apply Workshop for Community Business launch. And if you have ever, um, utilized any of these businesses, and I know that I have been to multiple businesses represented here, um, then you were patronizing a business that uh, received funding through the Community Business Launch Program. We're very excited about those results. 
Now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Diana Schwartz in Danville. They are about to begin their second community business launch program, and we are so excited about the impacts that they have had there. Diana Schwartz is the executive director of the River District Association in Danville, um, and she has decades of experience working professionally in retail management, small business ownership. She's an entrepreneur herself advocacy, business retention and creation, and executive nonprofit leadership. And we are thrilled to have her here in Virginia with us. Diana, I'm going to kick it over to you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to jump in and be part of the conversation this morning. So um, I'm here to talk a little bit about my experience with Dream Launch. Unfortunately, I can't stay on but uh, feel free to email and connect with me at any time if I can be of any assistance. And it's D-I-A-N-A, Diana at riverdistrictassociation.com. So as Rebecca had mentioned, this is our second round with CBL funding. We first applied for the CBL grant back in 2018 and were granted the funds. And so we started our program in 2019. Uh, we had partnered with our municipality in order to uh, bring the amount of funding available to entrepreneurs up. And we worked very, very uh, diligently to develop a resource list and additional uh, incentives. I saw there was a question earlier about in-kind. Uh, Jessica mentioned one great source is the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we've partnered with them and, and our, uh, our winners of the pitch competition were able to take advantage of a free year of Chamber membership. Uh, we also thought very diligently putting together the in-kind match because I know that's something as you're applying that's very important. But think about things like uh, partnering with graphic design firms. Maybe they can offer some hours to help with branding and logo creation and things of that nature. Uh, think about engaging your local accountants to maybe uh, provide a, a free 15 or 30 minute consultation. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to engage additional partners in this effort, but um, I'll back up for just a minute on that because I'm already talking about pitch. So we held the program in 2019 for the very first time. We did not uh, have r and I'm going to go back to R&D. We talked very closely with South Boston, who is geographically next to us, and Tamara is a colleague uh, that I respect and, and think very highly of, and she helped us uh, really with a lot of the templating, understanding how they ran their program, what, what she would do again, what she wouldn't do again, not to, not to talk for you, Tam. But uh, the end all be all is that very first year we partnered with uh, Longwood SBDC in order to provide the classes. And it was so successful, uh, we were able to fund two new businesses and two business expansions that our partners, primarily uh, the city of Danville, what they wanted to continue. So we were able to actually uh, have another round in 19, uh, in 2020 and again in 2021. So coming into 2022, we start our fourth year of what we have branded as the dream launch. That's our local branding. But uh, again, this is the second time that we've been able to utilize CBL funding for the program. And overall, over the course of uh, of the program for four years, we've had more than 250 people take the classes. Now we do not require uh, anyone that wants to take the classes can. You don't have to have a local requirement in order to tap into the classes. They're free. Uh, we've moved to virtual as so many people have now, so it's actually expanded the reach. And of those 200 and over 250 entrepreneurs who have taken at least part of the classes, over 75 local entrepreneurs have finished the entire boot camp series of six classes is what we offer. From there, uh, we've, we've had three pitch competitions and we've opened or expanded 12 new businesses in the River District in Danville because of that. But really what the beauty of the program is that we found an opportunity to use it to strengthen and grow our regional entrepreneur ecosystem. So we were able to parlay the success of this program, partner with some other leaders in the entrepreneurship space in the area, 
and uh, obtain additional funding from our regional foundation for that ecosystem. And so through that, we've more collaboration, more funding, more resources for local entrepreneurs. And honestly, I, I, the other great part about this, we've, um, we, we connect with so many subject matter experts. We find now for instructors, we reach out to various uh, subject matter experts for that particular class in the community. So it helps us to grow our network, our collaboration. Uh, it allows for these different professionals, finance professionals, to really get to know uh, the entrepreneurs and the community finance being an example. And it helps us all, it grows us further. You know, one of the reasons that we don't uh, require a local component to take the class is because you're planting that seed. Maybe they're not gonna open a business today or tomorrow or in 10 years, but maybe they are. And maybe they will now consider doing it in Danville if they hadn't before. But at, at this point, it doesn't matter. We're just happy to have more people learn about entrepreneurship. So what that has led to for us now, we still run the Dream Launch Boot Camp classes and we still have a Dream Launch Boot Camp pitch. But through this collaboration, we've now worked with our Chamber of Commerce and they offer a, a pitch competition for people that are not located in the River District. If they're located in other parts of the city of Danville or uh, anywhere in Pennsylvania County, they come through the, boot launch, uh, the Dream Launch Boot Camp class and then decide where they want to pitch. And so it's brought additional resources and additional reach and additional economic benefit, not only to our district, but to our entire city and county as a whole. And um, I would say some of the things that we, we learned through the, the process is, and, and things that we've had to change is, of course, going virtual. That was a big change. Everything went from being done in person to being online. We're all dealing with that. But one thing that we make sure that we address in our boot camp classes now is disaster mitigation, uh, not just natural disasters that we think of, tornadoes and flooding and those types of things, but now disasters such as pandemics. So we want to build in resiliency from the very get-go into our entrepreneurs. Um, mentorship is another big piece of that. We're very fortunate that all 12 businesses that have opened or expanded in the district and the three that have opened and expanded now in the rev up, so 15 total through the course, none of them have closed down even through the pandemic. And I really credit uh, the program to that, the way that they help you set up the program. If you are a CBL recipient, uh, some of the requirements they have are there for a very good reason. Mentorship being the one of the most important. So mentorship does not end after they get done taking classes or their grant recipients or not. Uh, the, the relationship that we have grown with Longwood SBDC they have uh, become such a critical part of this. They actually have an office within our offices now to continue to be able to provide that support and mentorship to anyone that wants to open a business, but most specifically, or already has one, but specifically to help continue mentoring our grantees and our participants. And then the other big thing that we've added in this year is a whole separate half day workshop for people that want to open a food or beverage related business. Uh, it's open to anyone, whether they're a dream launch or not. However, it's required if you're going to pitch to open a food and beverage business because of the health department requirements, the ABC requirements, the planning, the zoning, all of the certifications that they need. And so that's another thing that we've uh, improved upon this year. So I know I'm kind of scattered all over the place, but our experience uh, overall has been amazing. We have seeded so many new entrepreneurs through our region people who would take the class. They never pitched, but you know, just recently, someone that took the class two years ago has just opened up a, a new resale boutique for children's clothing in the area. So it's it's been fantastic for entrepreneurship, for collaboration development, for regional entrepreneurial ecosystem development. And it's really kind of become a flagship and what our organization is known for in the region. So. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it, Rebecca. Did I did I hit the high points of kind of the experience that you were looking for on the ground? Absolutely, and uh, you know I think your your points in having learned from other communities that have gone through this was right on, and all of the additional resources you all are bringing to the table as you continue to learn 
um, what the entrepreneurs need. And I really love that the SBDC is officing, um, holding office hours with the River District Association. It's so important to know who your partners are. Diana, thank you so much for your participation today. And here's Diana's contact information. Um, you know, I will mention, Todd mentioned community business launch as well, and we're gonna hear from Tamara, uh, Tamara in a little bit. And um, we, so we have uh, multiple folks on the call today who have experience with CBL, any of which would be happy to um, discuss their experience with you. So now we were talking about ecosystems on a, a district or kind of hyper local level. And now with Go Virginia, we're going to take that conversation to more of a regional level. Go Virginia is a regionally driven economic development initiative that encourages collaboration between local governments, higher education, private industry, and workforce by incentivizing projects that will create higher paying jobs in the traded sectors. And if you're not sure what region you're in, here is a map to help you um, figure that out. I would also really encourage you to visit uh, Go Virginia's website which we will put in the chat box as well so that you can take a closer look at these regions, see what their priorities are on a regional level. And why is that important? Um, because Go Virginia work is really broken down by those regional councils. So the board is responsible for awarding funds to projects recommended for consideration by those regional councils. And the regional councils are private industry led and have representation from education, workforce, local government, economic development, et cetera. So really thinking about all of the pieces that make up that ecosystem at the regional level. DHCD oversees the administrative and financial aspects of the board, while support organizations in each region provide similar services for the regional council. So you can see kind of that, that flow of how this program works. And each region is charged with creating a growth and diversification plan to identify target industries, industry clusters, and regional strategies. So that's really a recognition that what Northern Virginia needs may not be the same as what Tidewater needs, may not be the same as what Southwest Virginia needs. So um, fortunately, that kind of flexibility is built into this program. Different project types, there are per capita allocations for each region, and those can be in enhanced capacity building projects or implementation projects. So ideally, we are looking at the ECBs as being that planning component that then leads into an implementation project. There's a statewide competitive implementation pool as well, and an economic resilience and recovery pool um, that funds strategic initiatives in response to the economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, that is a fund that does have an expiration date, as you see there. So if you want to know uh, where your region is, with those funds, get in touch with our Go Virginia staff, ask the question here in the chat box, and uh, folks will work with you on that. So again, taking a look at um, the fiscal year 2022 funds, which was an allocation of $30 million. So the regional capacity building is at 2.25 million per capita projects at 17.5 million, and then statewide competitive projects at uh, approximately 10 million. And the Go Virginia focus areas have four investment priorities. Uh, we've mentioned workforce development, net startup ecosystem, site development, and then cluster scale up. So again, if we're thinking about Main Street and community business launch as those um, placemaking storefront based programs, then Go Virginia kind of takes that and blows it up a little bit. Uh, again, looking at the regional level versus the hyper local, looking at different kinds of uh, jobs and a different kind of ecosystem, a different kind of workforce. But we know that these all come together to create the, the best, most um, impactful and uh, desirable regions possible throughout Virginia. 
So our Go Virginia example is going to be Virginia State University. And I thank uh, Dr. Patrice Perry Rivers for joining us this morning. I just occurred to me it is still morning, I hope. And uh, Dr. Perry Rivers serves as the director of Virginia State University's Center for Entrepreneurship. She is also an associate professor of strategic management at Virginia State University and the primary investigator and director for the Minority Small Business Launch Center, which is powered by VSU Center for Entrepreneurship and is a Go Virginia funded program. And she is here to tell us um, more about what's happening down at VSU and the Center for Entrepreneurship. Uh, Dr. Perry Rivers, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is all over to you. You just let me know when you want me to change slides. Sure, you can actually go to the next one. So, so what we've done at Virginia State University is we applied for a Go Virginia grant. It was a per capita grant that focused on start startup ecosystem uh, development. And uh, what we did is we wanted to create something that aligned well with what we were doing at our university and our college, and then also aligned really well with the uh, strategy for Region 4, which is the Richmond MSA, where we're posited. And so we came up with something called the Minority Small Business Launch Center, which really allowed us to reach uh, early stage firms and to assist them with training and lots of other resources that we have put together for them uh, with our various partners. So technically the VSU Center for Entrepreneurship in our College of Business uh, are, is the grantee. Uh, and then we got a $453,000 grant from Go Virginia Region 4 Council. And our grant required a 50% match. And so we also received 238,500 in in-cash and in-kind support from partners across the region uh, in order for us to meet our match uh, when we apply for the grant. You can go to the next slide. And so our project was is really an, a, an entrepreneurship pre-accelerator. So we want to increase the entrepreneurship participation rate, that's the uh, technical term, uh, for just the entrepreneurship rate amongst minorities in the Richmond MSA. And so what we want to do is to offer business development training and an array of other services uh, like uh, opportunities to network with other businesses, like uh, specific assistance on <clears throat> writing a business plan, et cetera, like student assistance in implementing various uh, tasks associated with operating a new business in order for them to be able to launch and scale. Minority businesses throughout the country and small uh, businesses tend to stay small and we wanna be able to help them to be able to grow. We have been supported by an array of regional partners, including uh, the minority chambers and the Richmond MSA and the minority, uh, the Metropolitan Business League, the African American Chamber of Commerce is there, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and numerous other entrepreneurship support organizations like Lighthouse Labs and Startup Virginia, and also by municipalities, banks, the SBA, the SBSD, and then other higher ed institutions like George Mason, uh, which implements, and VCU, uh, which have uh, their own pots of funding that come from various state and federal sources. So we can go to the next slide. And so again, I've already talked with you about why we thought it was necessary for us to launch this or apply for this grant, but we really wanted to increase the uh, entrepreneurship rate amongst minority groups because it's such a large percentage in the Richmond MSA that if we don't focus on growing businesses amongst this group, then it has a, an, an adverse economic development effect for the entire region. And so what we're doing through our programming is, is seeking to contribute to the whole economic growth of the region. And, and this information that you see here just shows the vastly different entrepreneurship participation rates that exist between uh, non-minority groups and minority groups in the Richmond MSA. It's a similar pattern across the country. You can go to the next slide. But we thought that, hey, we're uniquely positioned as Virginia State University to help build a more inclusive entrepreneurship ecosystem in Region 4. And we actually would have the capacity to offer a comprehensive training and networking program for minorities and others who seek us for assistance with a wide scope 
Uh, and so I think the reason I want to include this slide here is not even so much as to tout Virginia State University, but for you to think about how your organization has the specific strengths uh, that will allow it to most effectively implement a program like this one. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So we had some clearly articulated uh, overall project goals, and that's to help these lower resource entrepreneurs create scalable businesses that ultimately produce higher paying jobs in region four. And we wanted to align this with the target sectors and industries that have been identified by our region as ones on which they want to focus. Uh, then what, so what we did is we're looking primarily at health, life sciences, communications, energy, financial services, transportation, the digital economy, et cetera. And that really allows a lot of e-commerce based businesses to participate in our programming, which is great. You can go to the next slide. So some of the very technical aspects of our program, including include student and faculty led business support and technical assistance. So our students help people uh, develop a, a spreadsheet for their products, uh, write a business plan following a template that we provided for them. Uh, we're able to provide them with entrepreneurship launch and growth certification training, some that we've developed as Virginia State University, and then also some that has been developed for us by our partners, including Startup Virginia, which has provided a customized training system for people who participate through our program, access to co-working space, both space that's at VSU and through our partners, we also have investor venture capital and bank funding training, regional entrepreneurship networking events, access to maker space, some of these things that we're building, other things that we already had and other things that our uh, partners had, but was not necessarily something that many of our target customers were accessing. So this just gives you an idea of the array of services that we attempted to, that we are attempting to offer through our, our project. You can go to the next slide. And then what we have is we have some program metrics. And so Go Virginia is an economic development uh, prioritization uh, grant. And so you really need to have some metrics that can uh, demonstrate that you are ultimately going to be able to contribute to real businesses who will actually be able to provide real income for both the, 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 the founders and for potentially some other employees in the future. So what we have here is we've got certifications that uh, we uh, have awarded so far just since our grant has been funded. We just got funding in July of 2021. We've been able to award 100 certifications. We've had 300 entrepreneurs who've been trained at our various events that we've had. We've had over 2,496 training contact hours. We've got 40 businesses that we intend to have founded, uh, five patent applications that we ultimately like uh, to be pursued. Uh, 10 new products released uh, or that we'd like to see released and 90% of participants who, be who believe that we've helped their business. Let me clarify uh, that this is not what we have accomplished so far. This is what we intend to accomplish. I apologize. On a following slide, then you'll be able to see what we've done so far. And then 40 businesses expanded. You can go to the next slide. And this is actually what we've accomplished so far. As I was talking, I was thinking, I don't think we've done that much so far. <laughs> So what we've accomplished so far is that we've got 60 certifications. We have 389 entrepreneurs trained. We're tracking ahead of our ultimate goal. And that is in large part, again, because we thought that we'd be uniquely positioned for large reach. So we've been able to be really effective with that metric. We've had 2,775 training contact hours, 14 businesses that have been founded, no patent applications yet, though we did have a, an intellectual property protection webinar last semester. Uh, we don't have any product releases that we have been informed about as of yet. Uh, our survey has not yet gone out to all of our participants from last semester uh, that asked them how effective our training has been, but we anticipate a positive response. And we have three businesses that have formally indicated that they have been expanded. You can go to the next slide. 
And so this just gives you an idea of the supporters that we have for the project. And again, I'm not showing this. So again, to tout our program as much as I am for you to see what you need to do in order for you to have this broad coalition that will enable you to effectively implement your program, which whatever type of Go Virginia program that you come up with. So we've gotten support from the SBSD. They've already had a training session at VSU, Chesterfield, Henrico, uh, Petersburg and several of the municipalities from our region have been supporters. Startup Virginia is a very active supporter, as has been Lighthouse Labs and the Metropolitan Business League. And so uh, we've been very fortunate to have this really broad coalition of supporters. You can go to the next slide. So, so I wanted to also just say one other thing to you. I, I wanted to just talk about some takeaways for success in garnering a Go Virginia grant. And I think that really helped, it, it, it's really helped me to think through uh, what would be I, ideal for people who would come after me, uh, for them to think about when they're putting together an application. So I think that what you wanna do is to make sure you identify a clear target group for your efforts and a clear project that aligns with your region's articulated strategy. I mean, th there is a, each one of the regions has to come up with a written strategy and they've identified the industries that they like to focus on and they've identified even some of the tactics that they like to see uh, to occur for them ultimately increasing economic development in the region. So you wanna make sure that you're able to align with that. You also want to put together a well-written and a well-thought-out proposal, which has as many uh, stakeholders' uh, contributions as possible so that you can make sure that you don't miss uh, what could be some of the selling points for your grant. You want to make sure that you identify some matching funders ahead of time for your project uh, so that you'll be able to have match funding because we have pursued a grant that required a 50% match. I think that most often, though, you have to have a 1-1 one, one match. Uh, and so that you're going to want to make sure that you seek partners who can help you with this uh, through a combination of in-kind and cash support. I've already talked about this wide-ranging coalition of partners that you're going to want to establish. Uh, but then when you are actually implementing your project, then you're going to want to co-develop programs with partners to reach your target. And then you're going to want to leverage your partner's existing programs along with yours in order for you to be able to reach your goals and most effectively serve the target that you've identified. You want to identify some clear metrics for your project. That's part of what you have to do when you're putting together the grant. But you want to make sure that those are metrics when you're putting them together that you can measure effectively and that you'll be able to actually reach. And then what you want to do, and this is something that we're still working on, is developing a clear post-grant receipt reporting process, not just for Go Virginia. They actually require that, but also for yourself, for your organization, and for your target customer so that they're aware of what progress that you've made. And so one of the things that we've done uh, to keep people abreast of everything that we're doing and the resources that they have access to for the entire process is we have a, a great website that you uh, see our homepage for uh, on this last slide. So thank you for allowing me to speak and I hope some of this information is useful to the participants here in this meeting. Oh, absolutely. I I am not able to see the chat box or to see people's faces, but I know that I, I learned a lot. Um, Dr. Perry Rivers, thank you so much for being a part of the program today. That was really great information. I I hope that everyone is is, is learning as much as I am and, and being inspired by what you're learning. And as we move from the the ecosystem building programs and the um, those really foundational programs of Main Street and Go Virginia that help you build those partnerships, help you as a community, as a district, as a region, identify what your goals and priorities are going to be and make sure that you're building a work plan that is responsive to that. that that's really building the foundation for what comes next. And one of the things that could come next for your community or your region is the Industrial Revitalization Fund program. Because once you put all of these partnerships and these great resources in place, you're going to need some buildings to put those businesses in and you're going to want to invest in the built infrastructure of your community. And that's exactly what this program does. So a brief overview of the program, the IRF fund encourages economic development and investment through the renovation of vacant and derelict structures in Virginia. 
Each year, the program awards funding to localities throughout the state to assist market-driven projects that eliminate blight and revitalize our communities. And so there are two really key um, concepts there. Number one is that elimination of blight, vacant and derelict structures in Virginia. And then number two is that market-driven purpose. So those are two things that we really need to see in projects and in applications. Since 2012, IRF has awarded funding to 38 projects in 33 communities, helping to create over 460 new jobs and leveraging over $86.5 million in private investment. And I want to note before we go further, um, and, and it's noted a bit here, that the program targets projects that will be catalytic to their communities. So we're talking about 460 new jobs and over 86 million in investment that are directly a part of the IRF program. Now, once you rehab that historic hotel or that historic theater or the historic warehouse that becomes a brewery and that gives rise to other rehabs and other jobs created and other investments in the community those are those secondary catalytic benefits that we see happen all across the state with irf projects so uh, much like with Main Street, the IRF program is receiving some additional funds over the next few years as a part of the ARPA Act. Um, the traditional IRF program gets uh, $1.5 million a year and caps awards at $600,000. And with these ARPA funds, we have an additional $22.5 million for fiscal year 2023. And um, we are anticipating a total of an additional $45 million. We just opened a round of IRF planning grants that uh, we can direct you to in the chat box. And the implementation grants will be opening later this year. So with traditional IRF, um, like ARPA IRF, the locality needs to be the applicant for these grant projects, although the properties can be publicly or privately owned. With traditional IRF, the awards are capped at $600,000, but with the ARPA funds, um, projects that fall into those categories could see awards of up to $5 million, depending on the project. One-to-one -one match is required, but for those that are funded through ARPA, that one-to-one -one match is only required for projects that receive awards of over $1 million. Properties must be vacant and derelict, and the future use must be at least 30% commercial. So these uh, funds can be used for mixed use projects that have um, a housing component to them, but the housing component can uh, be no more than 70% of that project. Funding priorities for IRF uh, needs to have a relationship to your local or regional economic development strategy, a high degree of blight and deterioration, needs to be a project that is really ready to go, that has that um, the funding in hand as much as possible, that has the phase one done, that knows what needs to happen for remediation, that has an end user identified and so on. A project with a clear end use, and again, that should be a market-driven purpose. End use has a clear and significant community impact and there is a high economic distress in the project locality. So if you're looking at this list and you're thinking, oh, we don't have all of these things, well, that's why we they all kind of balance against each other. So Annie Arnest, who is on the back end right now, is happy to answer your questions and um, staff is happy to set up meetings to help you think through what projects may be um, available in your communities. So these are some of the program dates that we have coming up for the next fiscal year. And, you know, stay tuned to our websites, to the Community Revitalization Office newsletter, virginiamainstreet.com blog, and you will see these dates as they roll out. Now, if you notice, I said that there were 38 funded IRF projects in, I think it was 33 communities across the state. 
And Bedford is going to be our IRF program example today because they have um, very successfully completed an IRF project in the past that has led to a second IRF grant in their locality. So we are very excited to have Mary Zirkel with us today from the town of Bedford. And Mary has been in the field of planning in public and private sectors for over 25 years, as well as in local government management. And uh, Mary, I didn't know that you had been the town manager of Buchanan. And she's been focused on economic development since 2014 and is has been with the town of Bedford since 2018. So we are thrilled to have Mary with us today to talk about what the Industrial Revitalization Fund has meant to Bedford. Good morning, everyone. So thank you for having me here, Rebecca. This is a great opportunity to shout out about what Bedford has, uh, has been up to in the past few years. So um, I just want to jump into this. Uh, I think Rebecca said I had like 30 minutes, but I'm going to try and sum it up down to five. So I think we can cover it then. But in the town of Bedford, and in full disclosure, this project is in the town of Bedford, but it was a Bedford County Economic Development Authority project, of which the town was a party to. Our uh, EDA was on hiatus after we um, reverted from a city to a town. And so we now have reconstituted our Economic Development Authority and have since, as Rebecca mentioned, got our own IRF grant for another development um, in this vicinity as well too. But we'll talk about the one that was the Woolen Mills. So this was the 2015 uh, view of what we were looking at in our community in the Grove Street area. The Woolen Mill was a very large complex of uh, textile industry. The building here was the 1930s and it housed the, the back house operations of what was the Woolen Mill. So this 16,000 square foot building um, has been the priority of this particular developer out of the 140,000 square feet in the area immediately uh, here. So um, they'd actually, the developer had done Bedford Loss, which was right around the corner from this back in 2014. So this is a high priority uh, for improvement in our uh, industrial district here. So this is what it looked like on the outside. And in the next slide, you'll see what the interior looked like. Um, basic open warehouse doesn't really look too inspiring as I really like those light fixtures. Those are really popular these days. Mm -hmm. So this is what it looked like on the inside. And I want to just cover a little bit of nuts and bolts because um, as Rebecca mentioned, it does need to be a targeted project. So we were fortunate to have a developer who was ready to do something with this particular building to help in the whole community. So the next slide talks about the mechanics of how that this can work here from um, vacant to vibrant. Uh, what the developer and the County Economic Development Authority envisioned was the brewing facility and restaurant that was going to be basically the first of its kind in the area around Bedford and in Bedford in our region. To, to tell you how it worked uh, behind the scenes was the developer sold the building to the County Economic Development Authority for a dollar. So that's what made it interesting is that the county became a landlord, the owner of the property, and they were able to leverage the grant for the IRF. So um, the, the county became the administrator of the grant and through a performance agreement with the county EDA, the town of Bedford and the developer, they were able to uh, make that happen in addition to other funds. So I want to also just call in, call out the Virginia Community Capital was a partner in this as well. So super important to layer these things together um, in, in these packages. So the reimbursement of the IRF went through the county to the developer, for those who aren't familiar with the mechanics of this. Um, and then the developer now pays rent to the EDA as the owner. So that's how this is working uh, on the number side. And then some more numbers on the next slide, talking about the, um, the actual budget that was submitted for this, um, 600,000 for the IRF. And it was leveraged with a lot of the work that was gonna have to be done anyway with the demolition and construction. Um, it also had to do with some asbestos. I'm looking here at my, um, my other capital stack here was talking about all the things that had to be done besides the demolition that you see there. So obviously it was acquired for a dollar, but that really wasn't what it cost the developer it was a lot more than that. But then the construction costs were already going to be done by the developer anyway. Um, so that's, that's the big thing. What I also want, to, want you to notice here is there's a line item for branding of 32,000 that the developer was um, going to be putting in towards the project. So we'll see what happens with that 32,000 going forward. So after all of that numbers go together, then we have in the next slide what we have today. And this was actually in 2019. We had some aerial footage flown of this. 
This has become one of our hot spots in the town. Um, Beals has really literally made a name for itself in the community. You can see it's still sitting in that same warehouse area, but what it is now is a destination. So one of the things I love is when my, uh, my colleagues around the area say, hey, I was at Beals over the weekend. I'm like, oh man, that was huge. When you tell me you've come to Bedford for something that, that we are known for here in Beals and Bedford. And Beals, we have a, a legend of the treasurer of Beals, Beals treasure. So that's where the brand was developed around that. So this is what we're looking at today. Uh, they continue to grow. They have some, um, uh, the, the big thing though about the brewing facility was this, they're, they're putting their brewing out there. It's not just people coming to Bedford, it's getting out there. So some of the statistics and outcomes of this project, well, when they opened in June, 2017, we've seen an average annual meals tax of 45,000 annual. So that's, that's every year in the, about the four and a half years it's been open. And the, the great part about that is the town council in 2016 put a half cent meals tax on the meals tax. So that half cent goes to fund the incentives that our economic development authority is able to put back into the community based on the success of this restaurant and others. Um, and so they ballparked about eight full-time employees and we're now at about 30, my last check-in with them. So, um, and they're doing great things over there. And a lot of people have worked at Beals and then they move on to go to other restaurants too. So it's kind of a, a starter for, um, for our community as well. And then the increase in the property value is huge from 61,000 to over 1.3 million. So that definitely will help with the tax rolls too. So very important to know that it's, it's not about the numbers of the, the, that, but um, that amount of improved property value is huge for the community. So in the next slide, you can see that we have um, really taken advantage. I say we, it's, it's Beals has taken advantage of their own brand. That's really important to see what Beals has become for our community as a place to be. So that one lighter photograph of everybody getting together, that was one of our business appreciation events through our economic development authorities of the town and county. So just as a place to be. And then the darker picture, I just wanna point out, I'm not sure how many of you may have heard, we had a fire at our uh, middle school facility, which was also going to be rehabilitated by this particular developer. And so we were able to come together as a community and hear from the developer what the plans were to help with that other project. And then the Beals brand, I mentioned, I love to see Beals out in the wild. I love to see Beals on tap somewhere. And then the branding that they've done, I don't know if you can read the, um, the, the beer can there, I don't want to say it out loud, and um, it was just one of those things that has kind of organically happened as people have reacted to the brand, and they, they react well too, and that's given them national recognition for how they, um, how they are in our, in our community and across the country. And then we just love our Beals brand, it's just, just huge, we see, we see it everywhere, and that, that to me is, is critical to what we're doing. Um, and then, so in the next slide, we're talking about future projects. It's not just about this one, it's about the next one too. So right around the corner on the other side of the railroad tracks, we have um, what's gonna be the 620 railroad project. This was one of our uh, Rubitex facilities, uh, which has been vacant for ages. No one wanted to touch it because of all the issues. And it's really not that bad once the, once the developer was able to, to believe that something good can happen based on what's happening around it. So this is gonna be 53 market rate apartments in one, two, and three bedroom configurations. And in the bottom, we're gonna have some commercial spaces too. One of them is gonna be a franchise. So this is again, literally right down the street within view of Beals and Bedford Lofts. And so again, it's about what happens next with our projects as we grow into these. So um, the last slide just has my contact information on here and just to shout out again, how much we love Beals and what it's meant for Bedford and just putting us on a map. And so. $600,000 can go a really long way if you have someone who knows what they're going to do and a community that's willing to help them do it because that's what we can do as local government is leverage uh, at least that to help move things off the dime. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Mary. That really is one of my favorite economic development and industrial revitalization fund stories. Um, and I will tell you that um, here in the Rowe household, we are doing our part to promote the Beals brand and to promote Bedford. Uh, my husband definitely has a t-shirt and it is not uncommon for there to be a brick of Beals beer in our refrigerator. And that is another uh, 
great point with this particular brand and other potential IRF projects that, you know, as Mary referred to, they are not only brewing the beer there, but they now have distribution. You can now find this beer um, probably at your local store or a local restaurant and taking on that kind of production and not just having a brew pub has meant additional jobs in the town of Bedford. So absolutely, we see that project paying um, dividends for that locality. And we are really excited to see what happens with the hotel project in the coming years. So thank you so much, Mary, for being a part of the program today. And definitely drop your questions for Mary in the chat box there. I know she's always willing to share. So next we are going to talk about the Virginia Enterprise Zone program and a caveat before we get into this. Of course, not every community in Virginia has an enterprise zone. And unfortunately, uh, we are at our maximum capacity for enterprise zones around the state. But we wanted to talk about enterprise zone number one, because it is a part of the suite of resources that we have in our agency for economic development. And it is one that can be, again, layered and leveraged with these other resources. But I think especially when you hear from our, our speaker here in a minute, you'll really hear how localities can um, think in terms of incentives and what localities can do to incentivize developers and think about who they are as a community and what their needs are and what those local tools are that they can bring to the table. So the Virginia Enterprise Zone program, um, you see mostly across the southwestern, southern portion of the state up into the eastern portion with a few localities um, in the central Shenandoah Valley and then northern Virginia, Northern Virginia in Winchester. Uh, so that is what our Enterprise Zone map looks like. And this is a, a grant program that incentivizes job creation and real property investment. And of course, there are different thresholds that um, zone investors need to meet. But right now, the applications are open for those zone investors who have created jobs in 2021 or have made real property investments that completed and received their placed in service documentation in 2021 one, then they apply for those grants in 2022. So it's a performance-based grant. And the real property investment grant, um, much like the IRF grant, can be uh, mixed use, but has to be at least 30% commercial, can also be industrial in nature. And the applicant is the entity that capitalizes on the investment or deducts the investment as a business expense under federal treasury regulations for tax purposes. Not a sentence I get to say often enough in my life. And uh, we, of course, look at qualified real property investments that are primarily those hard construction costs is, is what qualifies towards reaching those thresholds for the real property investment grant. Eligibility, again, this is performance-based. So if you receive your final place in service documentation for the state program, say in 2022, then you would apply in 2023. So these are investments that have already been made, already been completed, um, and, and then we are using the Enterprise Zone grants and incentives to reward those projects for taking place within the zone. Okay, let's see. So with those different thresholds, new construction, um, they have to meet a threshold of 500,000. Rehab or expansion has to meet a threshold of 100,000. If you have a solar component, that drops the threshold for the investment by $50,000. And the job creation grant, similar to the real property investment grant, is performance based. So again, jobs that were created in 2021 are now applying for that grant in 2022. And those need to be full-time jobs. There are um, wage 
threshold requirements. They need to also be um, offering at least to pay at least 50% of the health care insurance premiums for the employees. So these are high wage jobs that are being incentivized in um, localities that reach certain metrics of distress. Again, it's based on the wage rate, up to $500 per year if they are making 175% of federal minimum wage, $800 per year if they are uh, offering 200% of federal minimum wage with health benefits. And over the next couple of years, you're going to see that shift a little bit as Virginia minimum wage is scheduled to outpace federal minimum wage. So those figures are going to be changing a bit. Now, the local incentives is really what we're going to be talking about today. And the Enterprise Zone program is a partnership between those state programs that we just talked about and the local governments who have to have their own incentives to pair with the state incentives. Local incentives are really the critical components of the Enterprise Zone program because they provide the locality with the opportunity to tailor the assistance to the direct needs of the business community. So where um, the state Enterprise Zone program looks at certain kind of jobs, a local Enterprise Zone incentive may prioritize, prioritize different kinds of jobs based on their local needs. Local incentives should take into account their local and regional um, adopted economic development priorities and strategies. So again, even if your locality doesn't have an enterprise zone program, um, we're going to hear about some things that your locality may be able to take on to incentivize economic development. So some examples of local incentives are uh, waiving building permit or zoning permit fees, uh, real estate tax exemptions, uh, ta grants on machinery and tools tax, facade improvement grants, utility connection fee waivers, um, rebating BPOL taxes or fees, and then having workforce training components as well. And now we are going to hear from Mallory Butler in Newport News about how that locality utilizes their zones, um, both with the state grants, but most particularly for our purposes today, how they have determined their local incentives and how they utilize those programs. And Mallory has nearly 35 years, that is impossible to believe, of experience at local and regional levels. She is a seasoned economic development professional with a broad base of experience. And I know that um, at the state level for the Enterprise Zone program, we love to uh, tap into Mallory as a resource for all of the experience um, she has with this program in economic development. So. Mallory, I am going to hand it over to you. And Mallory is actually going to share her own screen. Mallory, it is the selection there next to the little hand at the bottom of the screen. It's a box with an arrow in it is present now. And you'll want to unmute yourself before you start presenting. Unmuted, now we're gonna try. Uh, let me hit entire screen and then y'all and now I can change my screen and you all tell me if and when you see anything. Nope. Not yet. Did you select the um, present now option? Uh, share your entire screen. Share. All right. All right. Yeah, I always. There you go. It's kicked in. All right, so there we go. Good morning. Nice to be with you all today. And um, there's nothing like talking about a program that is presently closed and unavailable until new zone opportunities come about in 2029. 
However, as Rebecca shared, what I'm going to um, bring to the table and share today, I'll tell you a little bit about my experience with the program, some of the impact and results from it, but more importantly, talk about the lessons learned and things that from the program that can be applied even if you don't have a zone or if you do have a zone to enhance the zone that you have. Um, so let's see. So again, I'm gonna share my experience with the program, the results, as well as my lessons learned. Um, as Rebecca said, I've been around the block a while. Um, I started marketing the Enterprise Zone program shortly after it was codified by the General Assembly. At the time, I was with a regional group that represented five cities. And those among those five cities, they held seven of what were then the 25 or so urban Enterprise Zone programs. When the program was initially established, it was dedicated solely to urban communities. It has broadened and expanded over the years um, to some 50 some um, zones now. Um, more specifically, in addition to marketing uh, enterprise zones for, for the bulk of my career, I've also served as a local enterprise zone administrator since 2009. Um, starting in Portsmouth when I renewed that city's first zone, VEZ number four, and then when I won that city's second zone, VEZ 20. Um, for the last five years, I've been with the city of Newport News, and I inherited one of the state's most uh, the state's top performing enterprise zone programs, uh, Newport News, like Portsmouth and Norfolk, was one of the first communities to receive a zone. Um, at one point, they had three zones because the city is very, very urban. Over the years, they now have two zones that cover nearly um, every urban, industrial, and commercial district in the city. Um, and it is uh, outside of Richmond. It vies with Hampton for the spot of number two for the most active state enterprise zone users. Um, why am I involved in the enterprise zone program? Why do I administer it? Because it is one of the best ways in the Commonwealth to promote economic development and revitalization in areas that are or at one time were economically distressed and now may not be so distressed because of the success of the program. And as you've heard from Rebecca, this is accomplished through the state's incentivizing job creation and real property investment, and then our local incentives, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, reinforce job creation and capital investment and can often be at different tiers or thresholds from the state. During stacking all morning, again, when combined with other programs that are available for businesses, be them state or federal or local, it can be one of the best ways to obtain and leverage private investment. Um, and just talking about those stacking and layerings, um, the earlier example of the uh, brewery, um, a whole nother program that breweries or anybody in the food production um, business in Virginia can utilize is an AFID grant from the Department of Agriculture. And we've had some success with a distillery in Newport News that took advantage of that. So again, you know, there are, it, the, it's a buffet of state incentives out there through a variety of state agencies to, um, to help communities and businesses um, su succeed and thrive. So real quick, kind of a, a, a summary of uh, similar to some of the earlier slides for some of the other programs. What are the impacts? What are the results of Newport News's Enterprise Zone program? Well, straight off of our 2020 annual report, we had 12 real property grants. We had five job creation grants, seven business uh, professional occupational license fee refunds, seven commercial rehab tax abatement programs, and 22 facade improvement grants. And one of the things we've also been talking this morning about the need to educate, educate our constituents, educate our elected leaders, educate our recipients of these grants. Um, if you look at what these grants total for each of these categories, and you look at, for example, the real property investment grant, and you see that you know through the state, 
12 property owners in Newport News last, uh, last uh, uh, grant year um, received over $650,000 in incentives. Well, that was as a result of $422 million in ca uh, capital investment in real estate. That means for every dollar grant dollar the state issued in Newport News, the city was the beneficiary of $641 in new capital investment. That's a pretty good return on your investment. And that's what our General Assembly members and our council members and our constituents need to hear that we're not throwing money at folks and not getting anything in return. These are pay for performance programs and Virginia and the localities are receiving the benefit if they can award a dollar in a grant and get $641 in return. That's better than I think the stock market's done on some of its best days. Um, again, we um, we created a, uh, our over a thousand jobs were created and they received over 300,000 in grants. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about um, the BPOL refund and the commercial rehab and the facade improvement grants. But these are local incentives that we put together that meet the state's requirement for the enterprise zone program to say that we have local incentives offered in our enterprise zone. Nearly all of these candidly are offered citywide. It's just the threshold is either less or the benefit is more if it's in the enterprise zone. And so let's talk for a few minutes about that. The other piece I'll share is we use these local enterprise zone incentives often as the local Matt, EP, and the governor's office put forth for a business. So that's another benefit. So what are some of the lessons learned? And then we'll talk about what you, what other communities can, can do, even if they don't have an enterprise zone. Well, as we've talked about other programs, marketing promotion and access to information about the program and the incentive is key, whether it's an enterprise zone program we're talking about or whether it's an incentive that is citywide. So um, we have developed a very easy, user-friendly, interactive website, and I'll share an example of that with you in a moment, that puts the information out there. We've all learned the internet is the first source for everybody, from site selection consultants to entrepreneurs and everybody in between. So we must have easily accessible websites and information. We need to have it downloadable. We need to have it reader friendly. We need to have all the questions answered. Not that we don't want to have a one-on-one -on -one opportunity to discuss the program, but we don't want to miss out and be eliminated because a site selector or an entrepreneur couldn't find the information about it on Newport News's website. So they skipped Newport News and went on to another community. Um, so that's a big lesson learned um, that I think is applicable to everything that we do in trying to improve our communities. Um, we also actively promote the state how to qualify and how to apply uh, workshops and webinars. There are two of those coming up tomorrow and two next week. We blasted those out in our citywide electronic daily newsletter last Thursday, and we blasted it through our constant contact. So the entire community, some 10,000 people that get that e-newsletter every day received information about it, as well as our tailored 2,000 person list that receives our constant contact that are the business community members. Um, how do we personally reach out to potential recipients of the state and local incentives. We do, aside from those broadcast emails, we do direct mail and direct emails. We mine data from our Commissioner of Revenues business poll, uh, business license list, from our uh, building officials list of CEOs, from our building officials list of building permits issued. We buy once a, once a year one of the quarterly reports from the Virginia Employment Commission, their SES 202 file, and we mine that information for anybody who 
who on average has increased their employment level over the last year by a minimum of four jobs. We also throughout the year talk to people and then we personally go back and reach out to them when the state deadlines for the RPIG and the job creation grant come about and we make sure they know when those workshops and webinars and deadlines are. Um, so, but, but that's information that we need to have out there and that's communication we need to be having. Having with our, we said, okay, there are no, the, the, the enterprise zone program is currently closed. We're maxed out with the maximum number of zones the state can have, and it's going to be several more years before one comes up. So what does this mean to the other communities that do not have a zone right now? Well, here an example of a couple of the enterprise, uh, of the enterprise zone incentives Newport News has that can be made available citywide. Remember, if you have an economic development authority or an industrial development authority, they have the ability to offer grants. Um, and we utilize our IDA and EDA every month to approve various grants that may or may not be confined to the enterprise zone. We have a commercial rehabilitation tax abatement program that our city council has approved and is in city code and we work closely with our real estate assessor to have companies take advantage of that. We also have the ability through our, our enterprise zone program, as well as through our tourism zone program, as well as through a couple of the other zones that we have obtained over time, the ability to offer a grant that is essentially equal to a percentage refund of a business license. We also offer an e-commerce grant where we will, for certain small businesses, pay 50% of the cost up to a, a threshold for updating or obtaining a website. There's so much business that has been transpiring over the internet and it's only been enhanced by, sadly, the COVID. And we're all learning that that is the first place, again, that consumers and businesses go to seek information. So our local businesses, our small businesses need to have a customer friendly, information filled website. We also offer a facade improvement grant. That is a citywide program offered through our EDA. It is available in the enterprise zone and if it's in the enterprise zone, the threshold for investment is less and the benefit is slightly more. So again, you can have these citywide incentives and if you do have a zone, you just tweak it so that the enterprise zone business or property owner receives a little bit more or can qualify a little bit easier. Um, when I was in Portsmouth, um, a, a colleague, um, initiated what was called an interior build-out grant. You all may know Toy Hunter. She's with the Hampton Roads Alliance now, used to be with VEDP. Well, she developed a program. It's very similar to most facade improvement grants from the standpoint, except that it's from the for the interior of the property. So this means helping a property owner who has vacant storefront space create a vanilla shell so that they can then bring a tenant in and provide TI. And that was a matching grant program. Um, and I would encourage folks to look at that and layer it with some of these other programs that are looking at how to fill vacant storefronts in a confined area, either through the CBL program or through the um, Main Street program. That's another opportunity. Um, I'd like to share with you, if I may, um, a, a view of our website. Let me see if it's going to open up here. Um, where do I go back? Let's see if I can get here. Here we go. So about a year ago, we completely redid with a lot of support from our agency and our GIS department, 
our Enterprise Zone website. And it opens up here with the key and you can see that there is a map of the city. Newport News runs parallel to the James River along the Virginia Peninsula. We have two zones. We have the Zone 31 is the green area, and Zone 3 is the orange area. We have a little introduction there. We then go down and have information on each of the zones with a short overview. We have we go further down and we have information on our local incentives. And we have information on those citywide incentives that have either greater benefits or lower thresholds if located, if the business or property is located in the enterprise zone. All of this information is available in downloadable PDFs. We have a nice map here that is a copy of what is on the interactive map on the website. And it includes a brief description of each of the submarkets in that geography. We also have a single page downloadable PDF with again, all the information on the state incentives and all the information on the local incentives. So I'll just continue with the theme here of you have to market and promote these sites, you have to, uh, these incentives, this information, these benefits to these businesses. It has to be easily accessible. And many of these local incentives that are codified as enterprise zone incentives are in fact programs that your EDA could offer citywide. Uh, so with that, Rebecca, have I left anything out? That was a, a fantastic overview of how Newport News utilizes the state and local incentives. And I'm so appreciative of the information on how localities without zones can also leverage uh, these kinds of activities and incentives for impacts in their communities as well. Mallory, thank you. Uh, I see there have been some questions happening in the chat. Thank you to the staff for um, responding to those. And uh, Mallory is going to respond to those as well. Anything that is specific to the information that she has been sharing. And we are going to, let me see, uh, move to the newly created Virginia Small Business Resiliency Fund. So we talked about our ecosystems. We talked about the built environment and programs and incentives for looking at that kind of infrastructure. And now we're going to uh, shift a little bit and talk about some of the microfinance pieces, that access to capital, that access to technical assistance that your building owners, your business owners, your entrepreneurs need to be successful. Uh, this past year, uh, the Virginia Small Business Resiliency Fund was created to provide a funding stream to existing community development financial institutions and emerging CDFIs. And this is deploying funding totaling $9.7 million. The purpose of the fund is to support Virginia-based CDFIs and build their capacity to support communities and businesses across the state by providing assistance to small and micro businesses that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, including those owned and operated by women, people of color, and immigrants. So the goals of the program are to serve small businesses, again, those that have been adversely impacted by the pandemic and have an, with an emphasis on sectors that have been disproportionately impacted or have been historically economically disadvantaged. And when we say that, what we're really talking about are 
those um, sectors, whether it's um, demography, geography, or a business sector that has not had the access to capital that other sectors have had historically. We want to increase economic activity in distressed communities around the Commonwealth and increase the capacity of the CDFI sector to serve these target markets in Virginia. And if you're not familiar with the CDFI sector, I would really encourage you to, um, to educate yourself. And Chris Kane, who is our microfinance program manager, as well as Andrea Longton with the Opportunity Finance Network, who we're going to hear from in a moment, can um, you know just be a couple of resources on that for you. But CDFIs really are mission-driven lenders. They do not operate the same as banks. And so these are partnerships that can greatly enhance the work um, that you can do in your communities with access to this capital and technical assistance. So our funding priorities is an expansion of services into un or underserved geographies and business sectors. Again, with that focus on those disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Timely deployment of the dollars, <clears throat> excuse me, or resources expansion of technical assistance services and lending products and capacity building within that Virginia CDFI ecosystem so that this fund can go to fund those entities that can increase access to capital uh, to small businesses and entrepreneurs around the state. So you might be asking yourself who has received these funds and we are not able to tell you yet. We are literally waiting moment by moment for the governor to make these announcements. We are very excited about this first go around with these funds and hope that um, the rest of the state is excited as well. So we're really looking forward to number one, making that announcement very soon. And then number two, when we do these presentations, maybe next year, really being able to um, show you some results of this funding around the state. So since we don't have a user of the program to uh, talk about this resource for you, uh, what we do have is Andrea Longton with the Opportunity Finance Network. And Andrea um, was hugely pivotal in helping us not only uh, get this funding in Virginia, but to help us build a program that would be responsive to CDFIs, to entrepreneurs, and to small businesses around the state. Andrea is a Senior Vice President of Development and Capitalization at the Opportunity Finance Network. And Andrea builds new pathways for capital to flow to CDFIs so they can lend at affordable rates and terms to local borrowers. I would encourage you to read the rest of Andrea's bio. And now I'm going to turn it over to Andrea. Are you with us? Yes. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, I'm really, really pleased to be with you all today. I uh, OFN Opportunity Finance Network is based in DC, but I am a longtime Virginia resident. Um, and so I'm so pleased to be able to talk to you all today about what is one of the best kept secrets um, to affordable financing for small businesses, particularly um, small businesses owned by women, owned by people of color, owned by immigrants, and owned by people who identify as low wealth, uh, low income, or historically disadvantaged. Um, I know we're at the, the end part of a long presentation, so I want to break it down into three main points that I want to talk to you about. Uh, which is one, I want to tell you about a new acronym, CDFI. Um, two, I want to tell you about a big number. The number is 12. It doesn't seem big, but I promise it's, it's really powerful. And I want to tell you how you can access this best kept secret of community finance because we don't want to be a secret. We want everyone to know how CDFIs play a really critical role in driving affordable capital into local communities. And Virginia is really lucky. We have some of the strongest CDFIs in the entire country. Um, and we're at a great point where um, through Rebecca's uh, help, we've unlocked capital and really critical capital um, for CDFIs who are able to take that and drive it in a big and powerful way, uh, an affordable way into our communities. So we'll start with the acronym, then we'll go to the, the number, and then we'll talk about how can you get it? 
Um, so the acronym is CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution. Like Rebecca said, these are financial institutions, but they don't operate in the same way that a bank operates. Um, they're, they are mission driven. They're not profit focused, they're people focused. Uh, and mo most of the time they're nonprofits. Uh, and so their focus is how do we get affordable capital into our communities? How do we serve um, people in places that have been historically um, underserved by mainstream finance? Um, CDFIs can be banks or credit unions. They can be loan funds or venture capital firms. And they've all been certified by the U.S. Treasury Department as both financially sustainable and mission focused. Uh, Virginia, again, is really lucky in that it has 20 CDFIs with track records dating back more than 30 years who have done some great work in Virginia and who stepped up during COVID, um, who, who step up every day, but in particular during COVID, to make sure that their small businesses, um, among all of their other um, borrowers, made it through and were able to thrive. Uh, often CDFIs went in and said, let's get you the capital you need. Let's make sure that you don't go under. Uh, with this loan because it's a huge cash flow disruption. Um, and they made sure that federal and state policy addressed um, how are we making sure that we're getting capital uh, into our communities that, that need the capital. We're not all Shake Shack. Um, we can't all get that great federal dollars as easily and quickly when we're not at the top of a big bank Rolodex. So how do we get that money in? And part of that response at a state level was creating the Virginia Small Business Resiliency Fund said, how do we get very local and get our small businesses the long-term, low-cost financing that they need? Uh, which brings me to my next point, which is a number. Um, so if you, you can, oh, I'll talk about this one. Uh, the other nice part, perfect, um, is that this program is a state program. Uh, and so Virginia CDFIs don't have to compete with the other 1,200 CDFIs across the country. Uh, it, this is only for the, the local Virginia-based um, community lenders. Now you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the number I want to tell you about is 12, um, where we have, uh, when a CDFI is awarded $1, they're able to transform that $1 in grant funding into $12 of loans into their community. So I like round numbers. Um, it's technically $9.7 of grant funding that CDFIs are receiving through the Small Business Resiliency Fund. We're gonna round that up to 10 just so I can do mental math a little easier. Um, that $10 million is estimated to um, unlock $120 million in community loans. Um, so I brought a visual aid because I know everybody has been sitting here for a while and I'm in my kid's playroom. Um, so when you give CDFIs an inch, they build a ruler. Um, because they take the, the $1 and then they uh, match that with other funding. Uh, someone earlier said that whenever you go into pitch, you have to be able to, to match your funding. CDFIs do the same thing. Um, they are well established at being able to capitalize themselves. So they take the $1, uh, they're able to match that usually through foundation sources, maybe federal dollars into three, um, and then they um, leverage that up um, three times. So. Thank you to my kids building blocks. So they take this $1 that the Virginia state government um, awarded them, and then they turn that um, doing what they do best, which is basic finance and capitalization and leverage that they're all their CFOs love to talk to you about and turn it into $12 of loans into the communities because that's what CDFIs are really focused on. So that's the second point. This fund is really powerful um, for our communities because they take the $10 million of grants awarded through this program, again, using round numbers, uh, and they transform it into $120 million into the communities. And we cannot wait to see um, how the CDFIs are able to use this money and to unlock that much community investment, often in communities that have been uh, under overlooked for, for far too long. So you can go to the next slide. The last concept is how do I get this money? How do I help my my community small businesses get this money um, and learn more? You call them, uh, just like anything else. Um, call them and say, hey, I need this. Uh, this is my business. This is what I need. Here's the capital I need. How do I get financing? Um, and the nice thing is CDFIs are a very friendly community and, and network. And so if they if you call one CDFI and they say, you know, we can't do it, but you should talk to this other CDFI. 
they can help you out. Uh, or you should talk to this other lender entirely. They can help you out because CDFIs, again, are focused on how do we get money into our community? How do we help our communities thrive through financing? Because any, as everyone here knows, you can't do anything without the finance. Uh, and that's what CDFIs are, are positioned to do. That's their goal. That's their eyes on the horizon is how do we get our communities the capital they need to grow to their full potential. So the best way to find your local CDFI um, is to go through either the Virginia CDFI Coalition, and I've put the website on this uh, slide. It's uh, vacdficoalition.org. You can also go to um, my company's website, ofn.org. Um, we have a CDFI locator as well, uh, but it is a national one. So if you want a very local, here's a CDFI coalition, I go to the Virginia CD, uh, Virginia CDFI coalition, find your local CDFI, give them a call and take it from there. So I will, I will end there. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. This was fantastic. And I look forward to answering any questions in the chat. Andrea, thank you so much for joining us today and for your education and advocacy around the CDFI um, ecosystem in Virginia and, um, and that broader Opportunity Finance Network. So I'm hopeful that everyone learned um, something new there about CDFIs. I know that when this fund was provided to us, um, I have learned a lot as I've looked into CDFIs, how they operate and what they can bring to local economies. <clears throat> excuse me so one thing that cdfis can bring to local economies are um, individual development accounts and the virginia individual development account program is a legacy program that was initially funded by federal dollars many years ago uh, we no longer have a dedicated federal funding source or a dedicated state funding source but there are various pots of funds that can be brought to bear to implement an individual development account, which is a matched savings program in your locality, in your region, in your organization. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll also mention this is the last program that we'll be talking about. And then we'll hear from Tom and Tamara in South Boston about how they have utilized a number of these programs um, in their locality. So VITA helps individuals learn to manage their finances and build their savings towards purchasing a home or starting a small business. And participants are encouraged to save their money while receiving financial training. Every dollar a saver puts aside is matched by eight program dollars and up to 4,000 can be earned in program funding. So if you are a saver and you put $500 aside while going through this financial literacy training, that is then matched with $4,000, which is a great plus up for your money. Participants can use their savings along with the money earned towards the down payment or closing costs for a home purchase or inventory and or equipment costs for a small business. DHCD contracts with local governments and nonprofits known as intermediaries to provide these programs. So how it works is a local intermediary works with the savers to enroll them in the program and open a VITA savings account. The saver then designates a savings goal and develops a budgeting plan. And they receive credit counseling and work to improve their credit and complete 14 hours of financial literacy training. They deposit their money each month for at least six months, again, while going through the training. And once they complete the savings and trainings, then they work with the intermediary to make their home or business purchase. Some tips for getting started, um, looking at participant eligibility and intermediary applications. Um, I will focus on one piece here. As I mentioned, 
We don't have a dedicated VITA funding source at the moment. However, CDBG dollars at the state level uh, can be applied for and brought to bear on creating a match savings program in your community. I'm going to ask staff to drop Rachel Jordan's contact information in the chat box. Um, she is one of the, the key players with the CDBG program at the state level who can help you towards uh, securing some of those dollars for a VITA program in your, in your area. So we're going to talk today to uh, Shenandoah Community Capital Fund, formerly Stanton Creative Community Fund, but they have grown from being Stanton focused to um, all of the Shenandoah Valley and hear how they have utilized uh, match savings programs for um, small business startups in that area. And we are pleased to have Joelle Allen, who um, I think is fairly new with SCCF. Joelle, tell us how long have you been with uh, Shenandoah Community Capital Fund? I'm actually coming up on my one year. I started off as a um, intern managing our social media though. <laughs> Excellent. So Joyelle is a program administrator with SECF, and she is going to let us know how they have utilized VITA funds um, in their region. Over to you, Joyelle. Thank you. I'm just going to reiterate some things that she just spoke on. So um, VITA program is a match savings program. Um, our clients are able to earn $8 for every $1 that they save up to $500. And those funds can be used to purchase a home for the first time or purchase assets for their business. Um, and the program generally is for individuals of modest means. For example, they must have less than $10,000 in personal assets. And that does exclude one car and one home. Yeah, the next slide, please. Okay, so how to graduate from VITA? Our clients have to complete 14 hours of training classes. That includes like financial management training classes. Um, I know that here at SCCF, we do make sure we provide the training for them. And they must save at least $500 for at least six months. Um, and if you're interested, here's my email if you want to talk about it more. Or if you're in the Shenandoah Valley and are interested in applying for the VITA program, my email is joyelle at sccfva.org. Next slide, please. Okay. So some of the businesses that have been started and sustained through the VITA program, we've had a sustainable flower farm, a basement and crawl space waterproofing company, a vintage music store, and even a production company. And as um, a senior in college studying business, I've learned about what it takes to start and run a business, but actually be able to see firsthand the impact of funding and education on small businesses has been amazing. Um, it's also been really rewarding seeing people be able to spend their money in a way that invests in themselves, whether it's a down payment or a home or even buying a high quality laptop for their e-business. It's been really great to be a part of. And the next slide, please. So I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about Very Brown. So Very Brown has been in healthcare for 28 years and um, she really enjoys taking care of people. Um, but in her line of work, she recognized that there was a gap in taking care of people, like people um, having consistent home care. They would have different caretakers come in and they would have to build new relationships and re-explain things. It was just difficult for them. And also in her career, she noticed that there weren't many roles that she could grow into without a college degree. Um, so that's how she thought of Ari and Me. It's a private duty and home care company. Um, she's able to meet the physical needs of her clients and also their mental needs. And she really makes it a point to become the friend of all of her clients. Um, and through the VITA program, Vary has been able to receive business support through education, one-to-one um, -one help. She's been able to get guidance on her business, figure out where she is, what she has the capacity to do now, and where she can go in the future. And also, of course, the funds to buy very necessary things to start her business without going into debt. And recently, Vary actually shared with me that she was able to turn down a job um, because of the business she was getting through Vary and me and her client. So that's really great to hear. And this is just a quick um, quote from Vary. She said, the program not only helped me financially, but helped me to rethink my services and discover skills I didn't know I had. And she also shared with me recently, she's thinking of starting another business and that she felt really empowered going to the VITA program. So yeah, that's really great to hear. And this is my contact information. My name is Joyelle Allen, once again, the program administrator and feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Joel. I love seeing the the pictures and hearing the stories of people who are able to purchase homes, people who are able to start businesses. And yeah, we definitely <clears throat> see generally during economic downturns and um, I think it has been especially true from everything that we have seen and heard uh, during the COVID pandemic that um, when you have programs like this, people are able to um, stop looking for jobs that they may not be able to find and instead create jobs. And so someone like Vary not only created a job for herself, but now she is going to be in a position going forward of creating jobs for other people. And that's such a great investment of those VITA dollars. So thank you again, Joyelle. And if anyone has questions about Virginia Individual Development Accounts or how they can structure a program, become an intermediary, uh, apply for CDBG funds, <clears throat> I'm sorry, two hours in, I haven't even been doing all of the talking, um, but please be in touch with Chris Kane, with Sabrina Blackett, um, who are on our staff, and they will help you uh, imagine what a VITA program can do in your locality. So now, last but certainly not least, we wanted to kind of bring this all together for you and look at a locality in Virginia who has successfully utilized a number of the resources that we've talked about today to really transform their community. So we're going to hear from South Boston, and you can see here a destination downtown South Boston merchants meeting. and. One of the reasons that we like to talk to South Boston is that uh, number one, they just have such a great track record of success. And number two, they, they don't have a big university in the middle of downtown. They, they don't have um, a huge population. They are in Southern Virginia, which we know has um, seen some disinvestment over the years and so we know that if south boston can do it you can do it but one of the things that makes south boston so successful is the people who are in this community and who are working these programs which is why we have invited tom robb who is the town manager for south boston as well as tamara vest who is the executive director for destination downtown south boston to talk to us today so you know if our programs are just just that they are programs they are resources but people like tom and tamra grab a hold of them put them together put their spin on it and and really create something that has recreated south boston so now i'm going to hand it over to tom and tamra thank you rebecca this is tom rob i'm the town manager here in south boston and we have taken advantage of a lot of DHCD programs, not only the ones with uh, Main Street, but a lot of the other projects and, and grants that they have. We, if there's a grant out there, we're going to go after it. Um, but we became a Main Street organization in 2004, and Tamara started in 2010? 2010. 2010. So we're very successful because of Tamara. Uh, I was a downtown store owner for 35 years and I've been with the town now since 2015. So we have tried to uh, move forward with a lot of things. The most successful item that we have done in this program is the community business launch. Um, I saw it, uh, I believe it was Ken Heath was in Richmond presented to a group of people and I came back and I looked at Tamara and I said, have you heard of Ken Heath? And, community business launch and she said, oh yeah, I know all about it, blah, blah, blah. And I, I look at it and I say, well, why don't we have it? So we invited Ken down, he went through it. Uh, what a successful program. We, I think, filled six empty things, but the thing that we learned was that we now know all of the little uh, empty spaces that we had, what needs to be filled, what has to be done, and from that, I, as a town manager, have sold 
three more properties to people that are opening businesses downtown. Uh, they weren't in the community business launch, but I, I've sold those and, and we're moving forward. So I think it was a successful and, and great program. And uh, along with that, we use the enterprise zone to incentivize these uh, businesses that have opened. Um, we, we, we just try to take advantage of every program that the uh, DHCD has to offer. Mm -hmm. Tamara knows more about all the different grants that you've gotten. So I'm going to turn it over to you. With, with Community Business Launch, we put an, a lot of time and effort into that program here in South Boston. I mean, because when you start it, you say, how in the heck can you go find all the people in the community and around the various communities that are outgrowing their basement? And so we put an awful lot of time and effort in trying to answer that question. We did end up with six winners, 15 pitches, six winners, five new businesses, one expansion. We did have one immediate spinoff of somebody that actually attended the class, did not win, immediately opened their own business. And they have since then purchased a warehouse and renovated that warehouse um, and become a downtown fixture in our downtown. Um, Asking in the beginning, what do you want to ask in the public? What do you want to see in your downtown was key to this program. We put in a lot of effort into what do you want to see and getting answers to those questions. And we ended up getting those businesses that answered that question. And we ended up judging those businesses with a different weight that, that the community wanted to see. Building fit was really key in this program. Community business launch, launch pushes you to get your buildings ready and to work with your property owners. Without working with those property owners during community business launch, we would not have some of the renovations that we have. Sitting there during the classes, trying to figure out if this one wins, where are we gonna put them? Making them go, go see the buildings, that was key. So in the end, this program totally changed the face of our downtown. We, it changed our, our target market. We all of a sudden had moms with lattes in their hands, strolling downtown with their kids and their strollers to the different businesses. We ended up in the, in the end, a few years later with um, Microsoft and Mid-Atlantic Broadband coming to our downtown. And one of the reasons that when we were showing them different places of where they could locate in the community and the downtown location, they looked across the street and, and, and said, we like this coffee shop right across the street. Well, just that one little comment, that coffee shop was a community business launch business. So some of those little things add up to big things when you do this program. Um, after um, the spinoff, we had a snowballing effect from this program of a lot of women owned businesses. We had um, Listers, who is a, a um, floral gift shop. Matt Wagner was here with Main Street America and he was blown away with their flower bar and said that that was, he uses it across the United States with his um, examples of best example of experiential retailing. We had Mother Cluckers mm -hmm. open, who was a home decor interior design shop they opened one week after COVID started and they are still here and are still a success. So we've just seen this proliferation of the power of women owned businesses. The, the picture on the screen shows just that this is a chamber picture. So it's only the chamber members of, that are women owned businesses in this photo, but um, we've just had a lot of women owned businesses that have really helped. And all of that is because partly because of community business launch. So, so after community business launch, we, we utilized some main street programs, you know, after that, when you're, when you're having your ribbon cuttings, that's great, but how in the world are you going to keep these businesses is what we focused on. And not only those businesses that won, but all your businesses. And so we launched into a retention program that we called Sobo Kep, Sobo Keep Entrepreneurs Program. 
we got some uh, Main Street grant and some other funding to help with a Keep Entrepreneurs program. And we focused really on keeping and mentoring those businesses. And as a result, the coffee shop location, in the end, if we had not been focused on intervent um, intervention and persistence with those businesses, we had one week where that was going to turn around into the owner renting it to a church. And, and we had to turn the ownership of that business around within one week and we did it. And then we had the, the cupcake shop who could not take care of their roof any longer and needed a new location, they would have moved outside of downtown if we had not found them another downtown location. So I just want to make sure that you understand that mentoring is extremely important. We gave these businesses the opportunity to come interview and sit in an interview and prove to us what would take you to your next level. And we gave many grants and we're not going to give you money for a shelf. You proved us what it would take to the next level to get you there. And the cupcake shop, for example, we bought her a freezer and, you know, I would have never bought an ice cream freezer, but she talked us into it. And that has been a game changer for her business. So the mentoring part is, 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 is really key to the, to the whole program. I think we, we, we did receive an IRF grant. We are looking at uh, developing our hotel downtown into a boutique hotel. You can see the picture. That's Rebecca climbing up in the top of what I call, it's a John Randolph Hotel, and we're planning to put a rooftop bar. And, and the, the name I want for it is the top of the John. Uh, and I think it's going to be a destination for everybody. We have a uh, developer who will probably sign an agreement at the end of this week, first of next week. Uh, and the good thing about um, uh, the Ma Virginia Main Street is having programs like this. I have picked up an awful lot on financing, just watching this that I didn't need, did not know existed. And this couple that's looking at uh, developing a hotel, I'm going to get them in touch with a lot of you people and hopefully You'll be generous with your funds. What else you got, David? I think that's um, I think about that's, it. Rebecca, yeah. did you, um, anything else? This is our contact information. Feel free to get in touch with us on anything and on any of the programs that we've talked about. We could sit here and talk on any of them for hours just on one. So feel free to contact us. And I do see Elizabeth Bowringer on the on the program. Elizabeth, uh, we we've got a million seven in grants out there from DHCD that you have helped us with and are helping us with. And those are uh, you know low to moderate income rehousing projects. And we just appreciate all that you people do. Uh, it's just a great organization, uh, great people, and, uh, you know, I know you have to put up with us out here uh, doing some things, but, but uh, we, we, we love what you do for us. Uh, when the grant came out for the uh, small business help uh, last year, two years ago, uh, on COVID, it was 550000 We ended up getting another 110000 so we we are we have given this community over six hundred and sixty thousand dollars in help uh, that took all of Tamara's time, and uh, no one in Halifax County would do it except us. And so we we thought it was important, and it was important, uh, and we're just proud that we did it and that we helped all of our small businesses in the area. Rebecca, you're muted. You're muted, Rebecca. Let's see. Get rid of this thing. There we go. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to issue a challenge to everyone who is on the, the meeting with us today that in a few years we'll all meet at the top of the john. Uh, Tom's going to open a tab for everyone. 
who brings their story about how the road show um, inspired uh, projects in their community. And again, I think South Boston is just such a great example of, you know, DHCD and General Assembly, and we can create programs all day, but without the imagination and the passion and commitment of people like Tom and Tamara, Diana, Todd, Joyelle, um, Mary, Mallory, Dr. Perry Rivers, all of our staff, not just in EDCV, but with all of DHCD, you know, the, these programs would just be words on paper, but it really is all of you who are on the meeting today that grab a hold of these programs, grab a hold of these resources and make them work in your communities. So please be in touch with me, please be in touch with staff and let us know how we can help you bring these resources to your communities. Um, I really appreciate all of the, the chats happening. Uh, we are at 12.22. So uh, we just finished the end of a marathon together. Thank you all for I joining us. Three. And for yes, hanging I'm in today. Of my AKA tree. Do I still? And uh, for for staying to the end of the program, we are going to make this recording available to everyone. Slides will also be available. And please do be in touch with staff so that we can help you take a look at what programs match your community needs right now. Uh, thank you again to all of our speakers. Number one, thank you to all of our staff for participating, Zachary Whitlow in particular, for uh, putting the presentation together for us. And uh, very possibly my biggest thanks of the day is to these three dogs for sleeping through the entire presentation um, so that uh, we were able to have a good professional time. Thank you to all of you and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming How to Apply workshops. Thank you.